Hello, my name is Ivan Lee. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the College of Information and Computer Sciences at UMass. Today, I'm going to uh, present our research around the theme of computing for the common good in healthcare, uh, more specifically, the use of mobile technologies in rehabilitation medicine. In order to understand how, um, uh, how technologies could uh, help and benefit our healthcare systems, let us first try to understand how we are currently utilizing our, our healthcare system. So first, there's a um, healthy person who actually needs to get sick. Um, after we feel like we're getting sick or after we feel like we're sick, then we go see uh, a doctor at a clinic uh, describing our symptoms in our own words and doctors uh, listen to uh, our extracted, self-extracted information and process them based on the years of um, education at their med schools and, and years of practices um, and make diagnosis or order more sophisticated testing. Well, this is a very simplified version of how uh, we are currently utilizing the healthcare system, but uh, more or less, this is how we start or at least initiate the use of the healthcare systems. So let us explore uh, further how technologies could indeed be helpful for each of the three steps that we talked about. So first we said, um, we need to get sick first. That is, we as a person needs to feel like we're, there's something wrong with our body. Uh, this sounds very obvious, but um, that, that we need to first get sick in order to go, to go to the clinic. But this is a moment that we start to put a lot of burdens on our healthcare system. So let us imagine ourselves that um, we have cars, but we don't have any gas gauge or gas sensor. Um, what can we do and what would we do? Um, well, for me, then pretty much I will go to the gas stations whenever I feel like I'm running out of gas or when I actually run out of gas and push myself, um, uh, push the car myself to the gas station. And when you when we think about it, this is exactly how we are use, using our healthcare system. Either um, we visit the hospital when we get sick or um, um, we we get diagnosed or find a new conditions during the um, periodic uh, uh, visits for, for phys uh, physical testings and so on. Um, let's give an example of weather condition uh, monitoring and prediction. Uh, we have um, maybe tens or even hundreds of sensors that are dedicated to uh, monitoring the weather conditions. And as a consequence, what we need to simply do is go to Google and type in what's the weather like or um, for the next couple of days in, in Boston, Massachusetts. And we get a pretty much good view of or an accurate view of the weather conditions over the couple of days at least. However, this is not the case for our health uh, conditions that we can't really go to Google and type in what's the, what's the likelihood of me developing a certain condition over the next couple of months or years. And, and we certainly do not have any information related to that uh, because we do not have biological sensors that are embedded in our body uh, that are sensitive enough to find the onset of any condition or certain conditions, um, certain conditions. Um, so for another example, we, uh, let's imagine ourselves that there were two aliens trying to visit uh, the earth to see if they can live with us in terms of the weather condition. So one went to uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, the other one to uh, Anchorage, Alaska on the same day, which is June 4th. And luckily on that day, the, the temperature of the two cities were identical, which was 78 degrees. Uh, we, but we do know that they really do not represent the true weather conditions of the two cities. Uh, but that's what is happening in our current healthcare systems, that our you know, clinicians are working diligently uh, days and night in order to provide the best uh, clinical services. But um, we know that they are very busy with patients and patients do not get to see them, um, say, more than um, um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 30 minutes. So as a consequence, patients as well as their, their clinicians have to rely on a severely undersampled data in order to make critical um, uh, medical decisions. So imagine ourselves that because we don't have biologically uh, sensitive uh, sensors to a number of conditions, um, to name a few, for example, cancer. We don't have uh, sensors in our body that can detect the early onset of, of cancer. 
um, although my, my research is not really um, studying cancer, but just for the example. Um, so if we can embed or even wear sensors that can detect those abnormalities or conditions associated with our body um, for us, uh, hopefully in the future, those sensor uh, data could indeed be useful uh, for clinicians to make critical um, um, uh, medical decisions. Furthermore, if my data uh, coming from my own body could be analyzed using machine learning or artificial intelligent algorithm, um, um, for example, uh, against the people of a similar age of mine, a a age as mine, or similar gender, ethnicity, or even similar um, uh, family history of the conditions, then I'm sure that those information could be very useful for clinicians as well. So my ultimate uh, goal of research is to transform this uh, hospital-centered and reactive healthcare system. That is, patients have to react to their conditions in order to um, utilize the healthcare services into a patient-centered and proactive healthcare system using on and off body sensors, relating the sensor data um, using the internet, uh, analyze the data, and provide the summary of the data to healthcare professionals so that they can provide better services. Uh, as you can imagine, my research is very interdisciplinary. Um, it involves engineering for the development of novel sensors, computer science for analyzing the data, human computer informatics for understanding how the information could be indeed useful for patients as well as clinicians, and obviously uh, medicine. So with that background, I'd like to um, um, uh, introduce more of my research, which focuses on the use of mobile technologies in uh, stroke rehabilitation. So stroke is uh, spice, uh, simply, a stroke is a blockage of the blood flow that goes into the brain, which damages the brain cells. And as a consequence, uh, one of the hallmark of symptoms is the motor impairments, which is actually more prominent in one side compared to the other side, which is called um, hemiparesis. So in the video that I'm showing, um, this is actually one of our study participants, a stroke survivor who's in uh, age 70s, a female, and she is actually asked to create the same movements with the two limbs. Um, and you can see that the, the therapist is actually inducing the same movements, but uh, you can also see that the patient cannot really make the movements with her um, left arm, uh, obviously, which is her stroke affected limb. And on the other hand, the the patient actually has relatively functioning, so-called contralateral uh, limb, which is in this case, her um, right side. The biggest problem with stroke rehabilitation, especially outpatient rehabilitation after they get, they get discharged from the hospital is that they only get to visit the hospital for a very short amount of time, which is 30 minutes per day and twice a week. And usually in the States, um, they can only, they usually uh, enjoy or um, 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 go through this therapy when, uh, when the insurance is covered and usually the insurance covers for about 30 visits. So obviously the, the, uh, the problem with this infrequent uh, visits or infrequent amount of medical services that we can provide to these patients is the infrequent assessment of patient conditions. So again, clinicians has to rely on only a very few snapshots of patients' motor conditions, which serves as a major barrier to design patient-specific uh, therapeutic programs and interventions. More so is the inter insufficient intervention that a therapist can provide to these patients to maximize uh, the motor dosage. So rehabilitation is more like learning a new sport. So in order for normal people to be, uh, so for example, a uh, professional tennis player, they really have to swing a racket outside of say 30 minutes and twice a week a training session in order to really become a professional um, a tennis player. Uh, similarly, for people who lost the motor function, they really have to work outside of uh, the, the uh, therapeutic, uh, th uh, outside of the therapy in order to regain the lost motor function as uh, neurologically intact uh, individuals or to reach the level of motor performance pr prior to the onset of their stroke. 
So in order to solve this important problem, um, we, have we have been using this finger-worn um, sensor that we can attach on top of the finger, uh, which is in a nine ax, uh, sorry, a three axis accelerometer that we're utilizing to, to monitor how much they make use of their limbs during activities of daily living. So technically we call it motor performance uh, in, in the free living setting. And more specifically, we are trying to capture both the gross arm movements as well as fine hand movements that are both very meaningful and important uh, related to the goal directed use of the limb string activities of daily living. Um, so we've been investigating, uh, we, we've been investigating both in laboratory as well as outside of the laboratory settings to, to validate uh, the sensor. I'm not going to get into too much of a detail, but um, for the past three years, we've been uh, working uh, to, to demonstrate the clinical validity as well as um, efficacy of the sensor to capture um, a meaningful information related to the use of the limbs. And we indeed uh, have demonstrated that the sensor data could capture clinically relevant information. Luckily, not so long ago, um, in starting um, August 20, uh, 2020, uh, we've been very fortunate to be funded from uh, the NIH to um, investigate how, how these sensor data could be used as part of actual um, practice of rehabilitation and also to maximize the motor dosage in patients. So uh, we've been funded for um, $2.4 million over five ne for the next five years. Idea is that we now have the patient generated data that, that are the sensor data, which will be related to the cloud. Um, and then using analytics, um, um, clinicians can actually look at the um, summary of the data and they can also provide the feedback uh, related to how patients are actually performing. Um, with the physician's feedback, as well as the patient-generated sensor data, those could be summarized back to the patient so that patients could better understand their true motor conditions, which will uh, further motivate them to maximize the motor uh, dosage. So obviously, the focus is that we want to continuously monitor what's going on with patients, but also provide uh, intervention so that patients can self-manage their conditions better outside of the clinic so that they can regain um, their motor function much quicker. Um, or, but important research questions are, so we've been talking about, for example, how can sensor data be useful for clinicians to devise um, personal, personalized uh, therapy programs, but what does that mean? How can actually clinicians be using those sensor data to create personalized uh, rehabilitation program and how does that actually look like, for example. Another in important research question to be answered is um, how can we uh, visualize the data back to the patient so that they can really understand or you know, get the clinical insights of, uh, from the data so that we can really motivate them to be engaged in the rehabilitation process. Our research team has not only been interested in motor rehabilitation in stroke, but we've been also interested in cognitive rehabilitation. So we've been, uh, we have teamed up with a venture company that created a series games, a set of series games that run on mobile devices like smart tablet or smartphones that can stimulate patients short term memory as well as selective attention in order to improve their cognitive function. So you can imagine this as a, a brain challenge games that are specifically designed for stroke survivors. Uh, first, we have shown that uh, the frequent use of this uh, mobile devices can indeed improve patients' uh, uh, cognitive performance. But not only that, um, we can seamlessly analyze uh, how well patients can actually play the games um, and extract information that are relevant to their cognitive function in order to translate their game performance into clinically validated measure of cognitive function, in this case, mini mental status exam. So in other words, the game can not only be functioning as an intervention tool to improve their cognitive function outside a clinic, but also we can use it as an assessment tool for therapists to continuously and more frequently on, on, uh, monitor their cognitive function. Um, our lab also does some interesting hardware and sensor development in order to address important um, research uh, questions related to uh, rehabilitation. 
uh, one of which actually was uh, motivated by this ring sensor study. So when we actually tested uh, or you know gave out this sensor data, sens sensor finger worn sensors to stroke survivors, a lot of actually stroke survivors have complained for its bulky size because um, you can't really get uh, get can be bothersome if the sensor could be very bulky. Um, the battery was the main source of the bulkiness. That is, for example, if you open up any modern electronics, for example, smartwatch, smartphones, uh, or laptops, um, battery or battery takes up most of the space. If we can get rid of the battery, we can actually make the sensor very flexible. Uh, that means we can uh, put it put the sensors on a very small part of the body. For example, finger or um, fingertip or inside your ear. And we can also uh, design them very ergonomically because we can make it flexible. In order to solve this problem, um, to, to enable this um, battery-less wearable sensors, um, we actually uh, um, leverage the human skin, which is a conductive material, to, um, to transfer the power from another wearable sensor uh, with the on-device on, on batteries that we are already used to uh, put it on. For example, smartwatches nowadays have um, on-device batteries. We carry our cell phones or smartphones with us uh, most of the time. And if the, those 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 devices with, with on-device batteries could be placed near the human skin, then we can use the human skin as a wire to transfer um, the power to battery-less sensors. So um, beside the technical challenges that, for example, uh, batteries need two wires to um, support the power that is red wire and a black wire, which is signal and ground uh, wires. But um, our skin does not have a distinctive path for the for the um, for the signal wire and the ground wire. So uh, we've been using a so-called capacitive coupling technique in order to solve the the problem. Um, not going to get into too much of a detail. This is the current prototype that we have. It looks bulky, but actually this is bulky because this is a research prototype. Uh, many of these um, um, components could be further reduced and you can actually see a lot of empty spaces. Uh, and, and, um, and we can really, really um, super miniaturize this to fit into a very small parts of the body. But for the demonstration purposes, um, this was the prototype that we have developed. Um, let me show you some demos. So, so um, on the left side, you see a, a battery-less sensor that is attached to the finger. Um, and then we all the powers we're actually injecting uh, from the wrist burn sensors. And this one is actually collecting the accelerometer data. Um, oh, it's actually stopped playing. I don't know what's uh, happening over here. But um, nonetheless, it's capturing the, the hand movements and it's relaying that, relaying that data uh, through Bluetooth low energy. And we are, demo we are showing the data on this uh, a smartphone um, application as a demonstration. Uh, I have another demonstration over here. So as you can see, there's no whatsoever battery. We are using the capacitor as a, a energy buffer. And you can see that the LED is actually blinking uh, on the tip of uh, our finger. So, so again, the power was injected through the wrist or sensor. We are using the skin as a conductor to transfer the power uh, so that we can really make the sensor super uh, miniaturized. Um, so that goes a quick summary of uh, our recent uh, work uh, in my laboratory. So for further questions and more um, for information related to more research projects, um, please feel free to visit uh, our website as well as um, 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 please feel free to reach out to me via my email that is noted over here. So hopefully um, you have enjoyed uh, my research talk and uh, thank you very much.